You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, when you hire a company to do work for your company, like an electrician or an accounting firm or a web services company, references are absolutely critical because a company is known by the company it keeps. I'm Michael Moffood with Group M7 Design, the oldest and largest web services company in East Texas with clients all over the country. And I wouldn't be doing this commercial if Group M7 didn't have Google's highest rated reference on their search engine under Website Design Tyler. In fact, we are rated higher than all of our competitors combined, 48 to be exact. Well, heck, after 26 years, I'd be personally devastated if we weren't number one. Look at our giant portfolio of hundreds and hundreds of our sites at the portfolio section at GroupM7.com. That'll make sense to you when I say that, well, since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group, and it's the highly rated Group M7 design. Welcome on, Senior. Thank you, Teresa. It is great to be here today. We're recording show number 15 of Volume 2. Wow. I know. Wow, it's right. right. We're really moving through here. I feel like we were just starting the second volume. This is already show 15. Well, Volume 2 is going to be a big one. Okay. So so we've we've got a long long way to go. go. I like that. (laughs) I really like the fact that we have plenty (laughs) to cover. And for the next several programs, we're going to be looking at Father DeSmet and Native Americans and and all. We were starting to talk about that last time around. And he had gotten permission to take a couple of the Jesuits and go out to visit the Flathead and see about the possibility of setting up a reduction out there. And last time around, we talked about the difficulties he had getting that expedition together, the first Part of it was he didn't have any money, so he went and raised money. And then someone who's going to go with him didn't go with him, and he was going to go on uh, a steamboat from the American Fur Company, and uh, they canceled the rendezvous. So it looked like everything was going against him. But you know, Father DeSmet is one of those guys who just doesn't give up. So what he does now is he makes arrangements to go to Westport, basically around the Kansas City area, and there he meets up with a wagon master. This is Thomas Fitzpatrick, who is going to be legendary in the settlement of the West. Fitzpatrick has gotten 13 wagons together. For a price, he's going to take a bunch of people out West, and some of them are going to California, some of them are going to Oregon. This is absolutely new. They're trailblazers because what's going to become the Oregon Trail, he's going to use. He's going to be blazing. (laughs) But he's blazing it. Yeah, there's no trail at this point. So they all gather together, some 69 people in those 13 wagons, and they they take off. They begin their their trip out west. And at one point in mid-August, the wagon train is greeted by a delegation of Flathead, So by September 1st, the Jesuits have gone with the Flathead, and they've gotten to the camp of Chief Paul, who is also known as Chief Big Face. I'm sure there's a story there, but I don't know what it is. And immediately, the Jesuits are impressed with the geography of the Bitterroot River Valley. There's a chain of mountains to the south. And those mountains are high enough that they keep the Blackfeet away. This is a a very violent tribe who makes wars on everybody. But the Flathead are pretty much safe from the Blackfeet because of that mountain range. And so that's a, a big help. And then to the north, there's another mountain range. And the Jesuits point out that this is helpful because of the bitter weather that comes out of Canada. And a lot of that is buffeted by that mountain range. So the Bitterroot Valley... It has the best of all worlds, you know. It, it doesn't get that terrible winter, and it doesn't get those terrible black feet. <laughs> so really quite nice. And that ridge of mountains to the north also provides a limitless amount of timber. Oh, sure. So there you go. And then besides all of that, it's also very remote. And so you don't have to worry about encroachments of white settlements coming in. Perfect place for a reduction. The information I'm giving right now is from Father Kalorian's book, Come Black Robe, 
which is a, a tremendous history of this. He says the following. He says, in these well-organized and at least quasi-independent reductions, the Native Americans would be able to adapt to new ways while retaining sufficient roots in their own culture. With their culture respected but modified, they could grow in dignity and health, religiously oriented as they were. After all, remember, they came and asked for, not, not once, but three times, asked for missionaries. For help. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so religiously oriented as they were, into individuals prepared for the world that was changing about them. So this would have been that chance. By the end of 1841, there were enough cabins built in the Bitterroot Valley to accommodate 500 people. And the Jesuits named this St. Mary's Mission. There were two interpreters in that group that were helping to make up for the linguistic problems. Father Dismet was much like St. Rose Philippine, never was very good at languages, and uh, his English was pretty bad, but he never learned any Indian languages. But he, luckily he had two individuals who were of great help. One of those was Gabriel Prudhomme, who is the son of a French and Indian marriage, and that was quite common, and he himself was adopted by the Flathead. So this is a man who spoke French as well as Flathead. And it was also another man, we don't know much about him, he simply is known as Charles, and he was also an interpreter. Father Mingarini, who is that Jesuit who does have a real facility for languages, he now is busying himself developing a grammar for the flathead language. Father Point, he engages himself in painting. And so he's doing paintings of the area, and they'll be sent back to St. Louis. And so it gives people back in St. Louis an idea of what the terrain looked like and, and the people and all of those sorts of things. Wonderful. So, yeah, that was great. Boy, that's a treasure to have. Yeah, yeah. So Father DeSmet would send these back to St. Louis, and then, of course, with glowing reports about that first year's work. This is one of his reports. Father DeSmet writes the following, and we're very fortunate to have all of his writings here in the archives. He says this, 24 marriages have been celebrated during my absence, and 202 adults with little boys and girls from 8 to 14 years old have been baptized. There were still 34 couples who awaited my return to receive the sacraments of baptism and marriage or to renew their marriage vows. I commenced giving three instructions daily besides the catechism, which was taught by the other fathers. They profited so well that by the grace of God, 115 flatheads with three chiefs at their head, 30 ne per se with their chiefs, and the Blackfoot chief and his family presented themselves at the baptismal fount on Christmas Day. Wow. Yeah. What a way to celebrate Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. And look <laughs> at those numbers. That's fantastic. You know? Yeah. And notice also that that includes the chief and his family. So we're going to see the coming together of these Native American tribes, which have been in war with each other mm-hmm. for generations. And we're going to see Father DeSmet able to bring about peaceful settlements with them. It's going to be really something. That's huge. Yeah. One of the things you notice also in his letter is he mentioned something about celebrated during my absence. Yes, I did notice Yeah, that. right. Well, Father DeSmet had also developed a real wanderlust, <laughs> and he traveled. He loved to travel, and it would be with him for the rest of his life. He traveled thousands upon thousands of miles, going about doing all sorts of ventures. He thought nothing of taking trips all the way to Walla Walla, to St. Louis, to Europe for fundraising. In 1842, that next year, Father DeSmet racked up 5,000 miles. In in one year? <laughs> in one year. I mean, I don't even do that with airplanes. I, that's what I was just thinking. <laughs> We're not talking automobiles and airplanes either. No, Or no. trains. No, you're right. Yeah, he's basically doing this by walking, by horse, uh-huh. uh, by Wagon. boat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. In 1843, he went to Europe, and it's in that year that he discovered a new means for fundraising Ah. Uh and publicity. And what it was was uh, a book that he wrote. 
and he had published. It was entitled Letters and Sketches with a Narrative of the Year's Residence Among Indian Tribes of the Rocky Mountains. Uh-huh. It was an instant success. It was translated from English into German, Italian, and Dutch. As a result, Father DeSmet ended up getting invitations to speak all over the place, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, Washington, D.C., New Orleans, Louisville, Cincinnati. Wherever he went, he brought his books brought with, his him. with him. Yeah, he's selling <laughs> these books. He's uh, fundraising. People are just throwing money at him. While he was in Europe, he also went to Ireland, spoke in Ireland, went back over to the continent, spoke in Brussels, Lille, Paris, Lyon, Marseille. Wow. Yeah. Then went down to Rome, and that's when he met the Jesuit uh, general, Father John Rutan. Had a private audience also with Pope Gregory the Sixteenth. You know, he did he, get around. <laughs> yeah, he sure he did. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting. He brought a message from the chief of the Flathead to the Pope. Wow! And this is what the message said: If the great chief of the Christians is in danger, send him a message for me. We will build him a lodge in the middle of our camp. We will hunt game that he may be fed, and we will be his guards to protect him from the enemy. Is that beautiful? <laughs> so they're basically saying, you know, if you're in trouble, leave we'll Rome. We'll take care of you. Come on, come on out. We'll take that care of you. That is so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, besides all the money and publicity that Father DeSmet got while he was in Europe, he also got five more Jesuits who volunteered to go out to the reduction. And he got a commitment of six religious sisters, this from the Order of Notre Dame de Namur, in order to set up an Indian school in Wilmette. With that, uh, Father DeSmet left Europe and headed back to America, this time on his fifth trip across the ocean. Uh, This time it took him around Cape Horn and up the Pacific coast to Vancouver, And then from Vancouver, he would winter in the Rocky Mountains in the winter of 1844-1845. He had been at sea for eight months. He himself says that that winter at that spot was among the happiest of all of his years. And again, I'd like to uh, quote from Father Kalorian in his book, Come Black Robe. He says the following, I shall always remember with pleasure the winter of 1844-1845, which I had the happiness of spending among these good Indians. The place for wintering was well chosen, picturesque, agreeable, and convenient. The camp was placed near a beautiful waterfall. The great festival of Christmas, the day on which the little band, comprising of 124 adults, was to be added to the number of the true children of God, will never be effaced from the memory of our good Indians. The manner in which we celebrated Midnight Mass may give you an idea of our festival. The signal for rising, which was to be given a few minutes before midnight, was the firing of a pistol, announcing to the Indians that the house of prayer would soon be open. This was followed by a general discharge of guns in honor of the birth of the infant Savior, and 300 voices rose spontaneously from the midst of the forest and intoned the language of the pen d'ore, the beautiful canticle, Du Deu Poussant Tu Annonce la Gloire, the Almighty's glory of all things proclaimed. In the moment of A multitude of adorers were sent wending their way to the humble temple of the Lord, resembling instead the manger in which the Messiah was born. Of what was our little church of the wilderness constructed? Of posts fresh cut in the woods, covered over with mats and bark? These were the only material. The altar was Uh, neatly decorated, bespangled with the stars of various brightness and covered with a profusion of ribbons, things exceedingly attractive to the eyes of an Indian. At midnight, I celebrated a solemn mass, and the Indians sang several canticles suitable on the occasion. 
that peace announced in the first verse of the angelic hymn, the Gloria, peace on earth to men of good will, was, I venture to say, literally fulfilled to the Indians of the forest. A great banquet, according to Indian custom, followed the first mass. The union, the contentment, the joy and charity which prevailed the whole assembly might well be compared to the agape of the primitive Christians. Permit me to repeat here that I should be delighted could I but communicate to the zealous and fervent those, ple those pleasurable feelings, that overflowing of the heart, <clears throat> which one experiences on such occasions. Here, indeed, the Indian missionary enjoys his greatest consolation. Here he obtains his strength, his courage, his zeal to labor to bring men to the knowledge of the true God. In spite of the poverty, the privation of every description, and the dangers with which he must contend. Now that's a Christmas. <laughs> yeah, isn't that, that's isn't that beautiful? That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> what can I say? I don't know. I was, <clears throat> so as you're saying that, reading that, I was thinking, gosh, there's, I don't even know what to say to that. What a beautiful, beautiful witness yeah. that they shared. I can just think of those 300 voices that come singing the canticle. Yeah. God yeah. could be no more pleased, I would assume. I'll tell you, this is, uh, this is good stuff. And, um, you know, I, how the young men who are going to Dismet High School should be so proud you know, of their namesake. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we are just darn, darn fortunate to have th this kind of information available to us, that these have been pres preserved over the, you know, this century and a half, and, and um, uh, th these writings are available to us. Wow. And yeah. thank you know, Father Kaloran for oh, uh, yeah. putting that in that beautiful book. Yeah. Again, uh, I encourage everyone, get and read Come Black Robe. Yeah, it really is a great, great book. Wonderful service he did for us. As exciting as this is, <laughs> okay, <laughs> it just it gets better. But oh, of gets course, better. okay. Well, I know that's not always going to be better. <laughs> that's right, because the subtitle is "The Smet and the Indian Tragedy." So, yes. but good things are still on the horizon. Okay. Perhaps the highlight of all the Jesuit efforts comes on a single day, and that's September fourteenth of eighteen forty-six. Okay, that's the you know the feast of the exaltation of the cross. And Father DeSmet is going to celebrate a Mass out on the fields. It's at that Mass, that time, that the Blackfeet, who had been the sworn enemies of the Flathead, actually come. They present the Flathead with a calumet, a, a peace pipe, pipe mm -hmm. yeah, Indian peace pipe. And the next day, then, a Mass is celebrated by Father DeSmet in the fields. They're going to be attended by Flathead, nay per se, Blackfeet, others, 2,000 warriors. Wow. All together in prayer. That's fantastic. Attending. 2,000. 2,000 warriors attending his mass. Of course, it's in Latin, and the sermon would be in, in French, probably. And of course, we've got Gabriel Prodome, mm -hmm. uh, that mixed blood interpreter, and the other, Charles who is going to be there also interpreting for the various Native Americans in all of that. Charles had been at one time an interpreter for the Hudson Bay Company. Oh, okay. And there's a relationship between Father DeSmet and the Hudson Bay Company, which we'll say a little bit about a little bit later on. Later, after that's all over, Father DeSmet baptized some 50 Sioux children, so yet another nation, oh, wow. and then began his winter journey back to St. Louis. On his way back, he gets as far as Council Bluffs, and he comes across an encampment of some rather strange people, and they're heading out west. They're followers of Joseph Smith, who has been killed by now. These are Mormons. Yes. And uh, Father DeSmet has an opportunity to speak with and spend a little time with Brigham Young. And he writes in his diary that Brigham Young impressed him as, quote, an affable and very polite gentleman. As wonderful as all this is, that the reduction is doing so well, there's an impressive church that's built in the Bitterroot Valley, St. Mary's. There are 14 log cabins. There's a large barn that's been built by this time. They even enclose with fences. They enclose a grain field with 300 acres. Pretty big. There's a herd of cattle, 30 head of cattle. 
They have pigs, chickens, the whole works. And yet there are storm clouds on the horizon already. For one thing, Father DeSmet is no longer going to get a discount from the Hudson Bay Company. Hmm. Okay. Uh, he had been getting nice discounts on all the merchandise he bought. But the fact is that the Hudson Bay Company was pulling out of the area and heading north to Canada. There were a lot of Americans moving into the area, especially around and south of Puget Sound. And so Hudson Bay was withdrawing, so he wasn't going to get those discounts there. Added to that, there was talk of war, this between the United States and Great Britain over the Oregon Territory. So much so that a British sloop of war appeared at the mouth of the Columbia River. Luckily, diplomacy won out over that, and a war didn't take place. But he also noticed that with more Americans coming, that that was also increasing the number of Protestants coming into the area, including Protestant ministers. And these were um, bent on converting Catholics and Catholic Indians Indians. away from Mm -hmm. papism. Mm -hmm. So we've got those things happening. And then also within the Jesuits themselves, they're being pulled in a couple different directions. The superior... Father Ruthan, back in Rome, was insisting that the sole duty of the Jesuits was to, was the success of the reduction. That's what they were there for, to serve the flathead. But at the same time, Bishop Blanchet in that area, he was appointed in 1844. He's concerned for the white settlers who are moving into the area also and knows that they need to have sacramental needs taken care of, but he doesn't have any diocesan priests. He knows that without priests, without the sacraments, Catholics tend to be swaying away by these Protestant ministers. Sure. So he's mm-hmm. concerned for that, and he wants the uh, Jesuits to serve both. And so with Father DeSmet constantly on the go, that's one less Jesuit to be able to help out there. And finally, Bishop Blanchet convinces Father Ruthan to send another director to the reduction. And this is Father John Ellett. Now, he's one of those young Jesuits who had come over with Father Nerinx in that first group that came over, yes, remember? Okay. Mm-hmm. And they all decided to become they Jesuits yeah, instead of right. yeah, going to Bardstown. So uh, he's another one who, who did that. For Father DeSmet, that Mass that was celebrated on September 14th and 15th in 1846 proved to be his last one for the reductions of the Flathead. He returns to St. Louis, and then he sets off for another European tour. This time he's going to be traveling with Father Ellett, and they'll be attending meetings in Rome. And along the way, also, they'll be doing some more recruiting. They recruit another priest. This is Father Miege, who is later going to be named a bishop. And also another Italian priest. And this is Father Ponsky Leone. He is an absolutely remarkable frontier priest in Kansas. His name is still held in very high esteem, especially in the Diocese of Wichita. But he is a real missionary to Kansas. He comes from a noble family and takes all the privations that a missionary would, spends his whole life for the people of Kansas. It's Ponce Leone. And then also Charles Ellett comes. This is Father John Ellett's brother, so he, he's going to come to America also. Father DeSmet comes armed. He brings with him a whole box load of letters of recommendation from bishops and priests and political leaders and he gives these to Father Ruthan in order to encourage what's being done. Uh-huh. But the fact is that Father Ruthan has also been hearing from some other Jesuits who are very critical of Father DeSmet, and particularly all of his traveling around, his constant activity, his constant travel, and then his absence from the flathead causes Father Ruthan to actually be critical of Father DeSmet. Next time around, we're going to see one Jesuit in particular is quite critical of Father DeSmet, and mainly because one of the things, honestly, he does is he tends to oversell his product in, in all of his enthusiasm. And so he's going to make promises to the flathead that nobody is going to be able to live up to. And some of the Jesuits really resent this because they're the ones who are stuck with the bag. You know? <laughs> he leaves. He leaves, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Uh, so next time around, we're going to see a little of the uh, oversell that takes place, <laughs> some of the resentment that takes place, but still in all, the tremendous work that this man is doing. So. Oh, that's great. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Monsignor. Can yeah. we close with a prayer and a okay. blessing? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in, in the, the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, be, world without end. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Okay. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.